Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to give you a, a talk about Ubiquity Press. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to us because you may not be aware of us. We're reasonably new. Um, but I'm also assuming that most people in the room work for publishers um, or, or publisher, um, some sort of vendors and so forth. But how, how many people work for small publishers? Interesting. Okay. And I <laughs> define small. Um, and I guess uh, one question I might have for you is, you know, if, if your company was to start again today, do you think it would start the same way with the technology options that it has? Or would it make different choices and, and perhaps grow in a different way? And so what I'll, I'll give you an introduction to how technology has shaped the way we've evolved as a publishing company and, and how open source has played an, a role in that. So a, a very quick overview to us is that we, we sort of are a very mission-driven company. We, we're very idealistic about open access and open science. And um, one of our great goals is to try and produce a platform that can return a lot of control in publishing to universities, researchers, and academic societies. We're kind of a little bit anti the, the large legacy publisher model. We really want to see a more distributed um, publishing world to drive the uptake of open access. So we, we spun out of a university, of University College in London. We're still a very researcher-led company, so most of the people working in the company are researchers or have strong research backgrounds, and we see this as our community. Um, we, when we sell products within the research community, we, we, we see them as if we're selling them to our own family. So we're very, very focused on the fact that we don't overcharge for what we do, we don't have high prices, because it's a bit like being a salesman for something and selling it to your, your family at a high markup. You don't do that. Um, you're, you're fair and you, you look after the, the community that you value. Um, so we're strictly open access. Um, because we're a new, new, new publishing company, we, we're sort of born in the open access world, um, and we figure that there's absolutely no reason to have paywalls. They only impede uh, scientific communication, etc. Uh, we publish a wide range of things, so journals, books, uh, a lot of data, um, conferences. And as I said, we moved to a distributed publishing model. So what we do now is we, we are a publishing company, but we also provide our platform for other university presses and libraries to use as well. And we've, we're now in, in the US as well uh, with a, an office in Oakland. So that's a bit of a background to us. But you know, basically, we spun out in 2012. So we, we, we sort of grew up in the open source, open access era. Um, and so if I was going to talk about our genesis, um, it was, it's very much about the fact that a lot of the things we wanted to do weren't very attainable. Um, often I use this slide to talk about the fact that open access isn't very attainable for people in the developing world or the humanities and so forth. Um, but our big problem was that there weren't many platforms out there that were available to help us do what we wanted to do. So we were reaching around on the tabletop trying to find our cookie. Um, so the things we were looking to do initially we were looking for a professional, affordable platform we could use for publishing. Um, I used to work for um, one of the large um, legacy publishers, um, which I'm, I'm so used to not naming because I'm used to being in front of a library audience who are hostile towards it. Um, but we and worked on their, their, um, their health sciences journals platform um, and basically built that and gained a very good impression for or appreciation for how hard it is to build journal platforms. I mean, that, we spent six years, I think, building that platform. Um, and it was just a technology replacement. Um, so building journal systems and so forth is, is not easy. Um, but what we were really looking for was a, a, an affordable platform that would work well in the humanities and the developing world because open access has to be low cost to really be adopted in those places. Um, so um, when I made inquiries about whether that particular company would open source the platform or, or help to build an open source one, of course, that was a, a non-starter. Um, and then we looked around for a, a journal systems provider, um, a commercial one that could help us. Um, at this point, I moved back to University College London to do my, my master's um, degree and my PhD and started trying to help some of the small journals on campus. And the cheapest provider we could find was going to charge us $20,000 to run a small journal. Um, and then they told somebody else on our um, team that it would be $30,000 for the same thing. So we quickly realized they were just selling what they could for the highest price they could, the highest price they thought the market would absorb. But this wasn't really the way we wanted to treat the research community. Um, we want to be as, as lean and, and fair in our pricing as possible. So we decided we had to run our own platform. Um, we didn't want to build one because it was high risk. It's very, very difficult. 
Um, so we decided we wanted to go with open source um, and have a very lean, low cost approach from the very beginning and be as start out being as, as low cost as we possibly could be and build up from there. Um, so it's, that's just our, our core, core principle is not to overcharge the research committee and not charge anything more than should be absolutely necessary. So expensive um, systems were, were a non-starter to begin with. Um, so we got started. Um, we published the first journal there as an archaeology journal. Um, but we started growing because we, we started using the open journal system software. Um, and you know, we leveraged it. All of a sudden, journals that had you know, a couple of hundred print copies were getting tens of thousands of downloads and views. We professionalized the look and feel of the software a bit. But all of a sudden, everybody on the campus was coming to us wanting to run their journals. And we had to spin a company out. And at about this point here, about um, 15 to 20 journals, we started hitting scalability problems with the, the open source software. So we, we started to notice that um, this was sort of a, a point where that platform wasn't very scalable. Um, it was really designed for bootstrapping um, journals up for, from nothing um, or for journals in the developing world, etc. It's good if you have one or two, but it was very hard to manage beyond that um, without a service provider doing it for you. Um, we also found that it was, while it had a reasonably large community, because it was mainly used for small journals, um, it wasn't really being used fully. No one was really using it all the way through from the submission process, through peer review, through um, editorial management, um, production, and so forth, to publishing. Um, most of the journals were just uploading their final files, doing some peer review, um, but that was it. Um, so there were lots of bugs and gaps in the software. Um, and we spent, therefore, a lot of our time fixing those bugs. Uh, and we found that we had to add a lot of features for bigger journals, because the, the, this particular open source software was more suited to the smaller journals, as I said. So when we started to have big journals moving to us from large publishers, they wanted extra features. Uh, they wanted faster workflows and so forth. Um, and we found we had to build our own front end to the product to make it more professional. Um, one of our main goals is to start competing with these, the larger legacy publishers, and therefore we want, we want to look, have a product that looks and feels as good or better than they have, so we really had to up our game. Um, but we also found that we needed to stay several versions behind the, the current version of the software um, because we needed a stable platform. And it, each, what we found was that they weren't regression testing the software very well each time they brought out a new version of it. So each time it came out, there would be more bugs, and we would have our customers uh, getting a bit upset about that. So one of the problems with that was we found we weren't able to contribute back to the main uh, code base as often as we would have liked to, because we were always a few versions behind on a stable version. Um, and I think a lot of the, the, the more advanced um, projects that are starting up now, that the, the CDL and the Cocoa Foundation and so forth are doing, are, f are far more focused on quality testing and, and and release processes would hopefully will be, you know, help us to avoid those kinds of issues. Um, but we scaled up from there. I mean, we went from those 20, 30 journals and we kept going and now we're in the, you know, four or 500 journals sort of level. Um, and that sort of gave us more issues with scaling. Um, we found that not all OS project products were as reliable as we'd hoped. Um, we used, tried using a book product, which never really matured because the community, I, I don't think, came around it as much as, as it should have done. Um, and that forced us to, um, to build our own books platform, which we called Rua, and we open sourced that. Um, but really, what we found is we, we'd sort of been waiting for this open source product to mature, and it never did. So we had to be very, very careful about that. Um, and as we got bigger, we had to build our own back-end system behind all these open source products to, to pull everything together and help us to manage a larger scale, more distributed system. Um, we also needed to start providing um, alternative options to clients. So what we needed to do was start to make our system more modular. So while we offer an open source editorial management system, we now also offer some of the proprietary ones like Editorial Manager and Scholar One, which are no one greatly enjoys using them and they're very expensive, um, but when journals are already on those systems and they want to transfer to our platform, it's easier for them to stay on those systems. So we've had to make our system more modular and allow people to plug in different solutions. What we're tending to find though is that they all tend to gravitate back towards the open source solution in the longer term. Um, just because it's much, much easier to maintain 
um, and we have built in some, some interesting features to it. But I mean, if you, with some of these, these large proprietary software um, vendors, if you ask for a modification to the software, it can take over a year if they will do it. Whereas on our own platform, or with the open source code base, we're able to, to make changes much more quickly. Um, but now we have a new architecture, which is based that little bit more modularly. We're able to focus more on the front end of our platform and, and develop our own, uh, our own identity as a publisher a lot more, while we rely on the open source products and, and the other products on the back end. Um, we're able to focus a lot more on the publishing services we provide, so we, we don't just provide the infrastructure, but we have a whole sort of publishing team helping all of the presses we work with. So we're very much a people business. Um, and we can look a lot more into innovating on the platform, taking the platform in different directions because we're not reliant on any one system. Um, and so our platform ends up looking a bit like this where we have our own backend, sort of backbone system, and then we have integrations with book systems, journal systems, conference systems, newspaper systems, uh, repositories, and we can plug different, we're, we're setting up the architecture, so we can plug these things in in different ways, and our strong preference is to plug open source systems in there where we can. So we, look, we have our, our book system, Rua, but we're also looking then at uh, integrating with Editoria, um, et cetera. Um, and so just to summarize, um, open source is, I mean, it sounds like we had a lot of problems. Um, it's because we, we sort of came in at a point where I think a lot of open source wasn't very mature in the publishing industry. But we, there's no way we could have started the company without it as an open, source, as an open access publisher and a, a low cost one. There's just no way we could have um, come out with a, a lean pricing model and, and been successful. Um, and all of these products are now maturing and, and, and lots of new open source products are coming out, which are, you know, I think going to make it a lot more stable. So we, we're committed to making our whole platform open source. Um, and we've already done that with the book platform. Um, so things like that will run standalone and we'll make sure that anyone can install them and play with them, much like um, Eric was mentioning with Editoria. Our main back-end system probably, it will be open source, like you said, um, in name, but not so much in terms of community because no one's really going to, to want to implement a system which is designed just for our company. But it will be available and anyone can look at the code and if they want to um, do integrations with us and so forth, they'll, they'll be able to very easily see how to. Um, we're also beginning an open access, uh, open source uh, book metrics project called Hermeos which you'll hear a lot more about over the next year or so. Um, that's a, um, uh, to build um, open source uh, altmetrics and so forth for books. Um, it's a European funded project. And a key part of that is we're going to just interface with uh, annotation systems to provide altmetrics about how people are actually using books and annotating them and so forth. Um, and that will be made available. Um, we're going to maintain compatibility with key open source um, systems. So for example, it will always be possible to export a journal from our platform to the open journal systems system. And the reason for that is we don't want to lock anybody into our platform. So we want people to know that they can always leave us and go onto an open source system um, without, and to lower the risk. Um, and we'll continue integrating other open source products. So the, uh, the Cocoa Foundation's pub suite system, uh, Editoria, et cetera. Um, large parts of our platform are built on open source in any case other than that, our search system, our book reader, etc. So ideally that the, our platform will be more and more open source um, as it grows and that, that will continue to be one of the ways in which we, we stay a very low cost provider uh, and, and to be as innovative as possible. Thanks. So Brian, I just wanted to um, emphasize a point that you made that I think is really interesting, um, which is as a service provider, you no longer feel you have a one-to-one -one relationship with any one technology. And having been a service provider in the publishing industry several times in my career, we ha always had a one-to-one -one relationship, service provider, platform. And you were able to diversify your technology offering and just noticing Richard walking in the room. Hi, Richard. <laughs> Thinking about, like, you know, if you think about a future in which Aries could offer two or three different platform possibilities for, but offer them at different price points or for different markets, that kind of diversification could be pretty transformative in the industry. Yeah, I, th I think so. And, and we also, we, we want to use things that other people are using as well. So we don't want to be a silo when we, 
if a university uses our system, we don't want to be a technology silo on the campus. We want to integrate with all the other systems they have. So we want to work with their repositories and so forth. So having, being open to all other open source systems is very important. I, I think it's an interesting way to rethink how we view platforms for, for, for scholarly publishing. 